please. Gospel according to Mark chapter number 5 in the scriptures this evening. I mentioned this morning a familiar passage of scripture tonight. Mark chapter number 5. We know this passage of scripture that deals with what some Bible students call the maniac of Gadara. And so it's somewhat familiar with us. But um, because it's a familiar passage of scripture, oftentimes we... Uh, maybe don't pay quite as much attention to it and breeze over it and miss some things. And certainly uh, there's, there's something here that I missed. Just because I missed it doesn't mean that you missed it. You probably have not. But I would like to show you from this passage of Scripture uh, something that I was shown and I learned here just not too long ago. And uh, you likely already know this, so humor me and just follow along and say, ooh and ah, I've never heard that before. Mark chapter number 5. Mark chapter number 5. Verse number one, may we stand together, please, give reverence and attention to the scriptures. Thank you, Pastor, for letting us come by today. I don't, I don't, I don't sit well. I'm thankful for our home church. We are there every time that we don't have a meeting, but uh, I just don't sit there real good. And so I uh, appreciate the opportunity to stay busy for the Lord. Mark, Mark 5, verse 1, and they came over unto the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes, and when he, that's Jesus, was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Because that, he had been often, I would point out that word often, bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? Now, isn't it interesting, this man that is possessed with devils, possessed with the very enemies of God, these enemies of God recognize and know who Jesus is. So the very enemies of God have got more spiritual sense than common man in our communities. And then notice what these unclean spirits said, I adjure thee by God. So here's a devil adjuring uh, the son of God in the name of God. I'm not preaching on that, but I find that interesting. I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, what is thy name? And he answered saying, my name is Legion for we are many. Because this is a familiar passage of scripture, I'll leave off reading there. I'd like to deal with the subject tonight of what the sinner in the tombs saw. What the sinner in the tomb saw. You'll see what I mean in a moment. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we bow before you and pray that you'd help us tonight to be diligent Bible students of the word of God. We can't do that on our own. And so we look to you, lean upon you and you alone. I pray, Father, that we might be strengthened, encouraged and helped tonight with the word of God. Lord, we're begin, about to begin a brand new week, but please help us on purpose to put the activities of the week or even tonight out of our mind to focus on what you have for us tonight. Help us, Lord, we pray. I pray, Father, we'd have some understanding, maybe a little bit from the Word of God of why things happen to us just like they do. And once again, on purpose, I pray, not only for thine unction, but I pray that you'd bring forth the fruit around the altars that would most glorify you and you alone, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you and be seated, please. We know the rest of the story. We know how that in verses 12 and 13, Jesus cast the unclean spirits out of the man into a herd of of swine and someone wisely said that's the first time in history we had deviled ham but nonetheless we find that the devils went out of the man into the swine and ran down a steep place and choked themselves uh, in the sea we know that as a result of that we find the condition of the man that was possessed of these devils verse number 15 and they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in the right mind and they they were afraid. We find that Jesus did for this man that nobody else could do uh, for this man. And so I'm thankful for that, the power of God that worked in this man's life. But what amazes me is what follows verse number 15. Because we read how that this man had often been bound with chains and fetters. We chains, we understand, fetters is that which binds the feet. 
And we, I pointed out the word often, over and over and over again, evidently, the people of this area said within themselves, we've got to do something about this guy. In fact, in Matthew chapter number 8, this same account, it says that he was so fierce that no man might pass by that way. They were careful that nobody went by the tombs where this man lived. And so there was obviously times where they got chains and fetters together and they came and bound him up and they tried to tame him. But it didn't work, no doubt, because of the demonic possession that he experienced. He busted the chains asunder. And so Jesus comes along now. Here's the man sitting clothed in his right mind. The Savior did for this man what society couldn't do, what the people of the area couldn't do, what plan or procedure could not do. But look at verse 16. And they saw, uh, and they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed of the devil and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him, Jesus. They began to pray him to depart out of their coat. I would think that the people would be appreciative of what the Savior has done. Because Jesus has done what they could not do. Finally, this man was no longer a menace to their society. But instead of being thankful and appreciating what the Savior did, they came to the Lord Jesus and said, "Uh, Sir, we'd rather you not be here. Would you please leave? I find that pretty remarkable. But yet let's stop and think about it. This is the region of Gadara. The root word of Gadara is Gad. Gad, Gad, Gad. We we read about Gad in the Old Testament. In fact, Gad is one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Even more than that, Gad is one of the two and a half tribes that did not go all the way into Canaan land possession according to the word of God and according to the will of God. You remember, there was two and a half tribes that came to Moses and said, hey, the land on this side of Jordan is, is, is a land that's good for cattle and thy servants have cattle. Let us have our possession here. We don't want to go all the way according to the word of God. We don't want to go all the way in the will of God. We're more interested in our cows. We're more interested in material things than we are spiritual things. We're more interested in earthly things than we are godly things. And as a result, we find that two and a half tribes, including the tribe of Gad, stopped short of the will of God and they were more mindful of earthly things. And could it be that now, all these generations later, their kinfolk, their generations are dealing with severe demonology in their midst and we find that their descendants want absolutely nothing to do with the Savior whatsoever even though he's done a remarkable work in their midst. Oh man, that challenges me when God tells us and leads us to do something. He doesn't expect us to go part of the way or most of the way. He expects us to go all of the way lest there be severe spiritual consequences Consequences, not only in our life, but in generations to come, in our families as well. And so we come to the maniac of Gadara, what Bible students call this. And there's some things that we obviously know, so let's remind ourselves of them. Let's remind ourselves of this man's condition. First of all, he was ungodly, verse number two. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him uh, out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. Here is a man that is demon-possessed. What is thy name legion for we are many we didn't read it but we find that when jesus released these devils out of the man it did enter into a swine of about a herd of swine of about 2000 specifically i don't know how many devils are in this man regardless one is enough here is a man that what we would call demon possessed probably right here it would be good for me to stop and say that I do not believe that the Bible teaches that a blood-bought child of God can be demon-possessed. When a person gets saved, the Holy Ghost of God comes to live inside of them. We know that because of Romans chapter 8 and verse number 9. What? Uh, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And my dear friend, the Holy Spirit and an unclean spirit is not going to live in the same house. 
A child of God can be demon oppressed. Possession is from the inside. Oppression is from the outside. I don't know what you believe about uh, King Saul of the Old Testament, of whether he was saved or whether he was lost among some people. There is some controversy about that. But we do say, we do see from the word of God that an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. He was not possessed from the inside, but he was oppressed from the outside. And you and I, as a blood-bought child of God, we cannot be possessed. Where, a, where, where unclean spirits take over us, but we certainly can be oppressed from the outside. Now, having said that, let me say this, that if you're here tonight and you're not saved, and the Holy Ghost of God does not live inside of you, you very well could be a candidate for demon possession. I'm not saying that you will. I'm not saying that you are. But I am saying there's no safeguard against it because the Spirit of God does not live inside of you. This man's condition, he was an ungodly man. Verse number three, he was an unsettled man and had his dwelling among the tombs and no man uh, no man could bind him. No, not with chains. He was unsettled. He was homeless. He dwelt among the tombs. He lived among the dead. I don't know you personally, but I think it's safe for me to say that everybody here tonight has some form of a home to go to when the service is over. Not this man. This man is going to live in the cemetery, if you will. He's going to live in the tombs, if you will. Later on, when Jesus does a work in his life, he's going to desire to go with the Savior everywhere that the Savior goes. And by the way, when people get right with God and God does a work in their life, that's what they want too. They just want to be where God is. And Jesus is going to say, no, go home to thy friends and tell them what great things I have done for thee. But he right now in his current uh, position that we are reading early in the chapter, he cannot go home to his friends because of this demonic possession that he is experiencing. Here is a man that is completely unsettled. He is homeless. How would you like to leave the services tonight and have to spend the night after night after night? In a graveyard. Verse number four, we find that he was uncontrollable because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains and the chains had been plucked asunder by him uh, and uh, neither could any man tame him. There was no help for this man by procedure. I'm going to just assume that the men of the area got together and they said, we've come up with this plan, this procedure. We're going to bind him with chains and we're going to bind him with fetters. But there was no procedure that would help him. The Bible specifically points out neither Neither could any man tame him. So whether by procedure or any person, listen, there was no plan. There was no program. There was no place. There was no person. There was no counselor. There was nobody that could help this man that had the problem that he had in Mark chapter number five. The very fact that often he had been bound with chains proved he was a menace to society, but there was absolutely nothing humanly possible. Possible that could be done for this man. Verse number five, we learned that he was uncaring and always night and day. He was in the mountains and in the tombs crying, look at this, and cutting himself with stones. If he had no more concern for himself but to cut himself with stones, you know he had abs absolutely no care or concern uh, for anybody else as well. We know the end of the story, but just, just follow my thinking for a little bit. I, I, is there any stop and think. Is there any help for this man whatsoever? Is there any hope for this man whatsoever? You want to talk about a helpless, hopeless situation. We are reading about it tonight in the word of God. However, we are looking at this man from the outside. Stop and think just a moment of what this man was living with within himself. Think how that this man, no doubt, day after day thought, this is, this is my life. This is the way that it's going to be. I'll never have a home that I can go to. I'm going to have to live among the dead in the tomb. Just think what went on inside of this man when he heard the group of men or whoever it was that came with chains and fetters and he no doubt thought in his mind and said to himself, here they come again. They're tired of having me around. They're going to try and bind me up. They're going to try and fix me up. They're going to try and take me off somewhere so that I'm no longer a problem to them, their wives and their children. Just in a short segment of time, stop and think in your mind just what was going on uh, inside of this man and what this man was living with being possessed 
with these devils. But the thing that I missed, we know that. But the thing that I missed was, was his location. Verse number five. And always night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. Verse number one, we learned that these mountains in tombs were near the sea and they came over into the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. And when they came over to the other side of the sea, verse number two says, and when he, Jesus, was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with unclean spirits. So on the edge of the sea, we've got these mountains. Within these mountains are these tombs. Now we know in Bible times that tombs were often caves with stones. After they put the dead in there, stones covered the mouth of the cave or were stacked up to cover the mouth of the cave. And so here on the edge of this sea, and by the way, I've, I've looked some things up uh, on the computer concerning this sea. This sea is not real wide. It's not real far across. You can see the other side, but right on the edge of the sea, uh, uh, we find mountains. There was caves in these mountains that they used for tombs. I was preaching along this line at Brother Griswood's church in, in Paris, Texas. Paris, Texas. I, I always got to put that Texas part on there. would have sounded better if I could have stopped at Paris. But anyway, uh, Brother John Griswood in the same class with your pastor in, in Bible college. Um, but I think Brother Griswood graduated. But anyway, um, wait, wait. Uh, no, they both graduated again. In fact, your pastor graduated ahead of him in the class. But anyhow, I was preaching along this line down at Brother John Griswood's in Paris, Texas uh, 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 some years ago. And after the service, one of the faithful ladies in the church came to me and said, Brother Hart, it's exactly like the Bible says. Not that the word of God needs validation, but she was just saying, Brother Hart, I've been there. I've been to that sea. It's just like the word of God says. On the edge of the sea are these mountains. And still today, there are two in the sides of this mountains. And so we find here's this man in the mountains and tombs It's on the edge of the sea so much so that as soon as Jesus came across the sea, we find that he presented himself unto the Savior. Now, if we're reading our Bible, I would dare say that the majority of us, if not all of us, probably when we spend our personal time in the word of God, we probably read by chapters in the word of God. So many chapters or maybe, maybe like, maybe you do like me, I read so many pages in the Word of God, but when I get done, I know how many pages I need to read to get through the Scriptures at least one time a year. But when I get done with that page, I don't stop there. I go ahead and read uh, to the end of the next chapter. And so if our Bible reading was in the Gospel of Mark, and we read Mark chapter number 4, and we've done our quota for the day, however you want to call it, we would likely stop at the end of Mark chapter number four, and we'd start Mark chapter number five on the next day because of the chapter division. But because that's the case, oftentimes we do not recognize because of the chapter divisions that the next chapter is a continuation of what was taking place in the previous chapter. Look at verse one of chapter five. And they came over unto the other side of the sea into the country of the gatherings. Verse number one is a link and tells us that it is a continuation in, uh, from the events at the end of chapter number four. So what we have read in chapter number five is a continuation of what's taking place at the end of chapter number four. So let's get the whole picture back up to chapter four and look, if you would please, at verse number 35. And the same day when the even was come, he, Jesus, saith unto them, the disciples, let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. I often wonder who these little ships were with him. Maybe it was relationship, worship, fellowship. I'm not sure. But anyway, there was other little ships with him. And there arose a great storm of wind and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full and he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow and they awake him and say unto him master carest thou not that we perish time out I'm going to ask a question that we already know the answer to the question is did Jesus know when he told the disciples to get into the ship and sail to the other side and he was going to go in the hinder part of the ship and fall asleep on a pillow did Jesus know that the storm was going to come? And the obvious answer is yes, because he's God. We know that. 
So then, we put all that together and recognize something else that we have learned and we know. That means that the Savior sent His children right into a storm. Now, there are some people that say because of the geographical lay of the land with the mountains on the one side and so forth, it's very common for people to sail across this sea and for storms to suddenly brew up and suddenly come up because there are some people that say many of the disciples were commercial fishermen. And if there was any hint or any evidence of a storm coming up before they sailed, they would have never done it. Well, that may not be the case because the Savior told the disciples to get into the ship and sail to the other side. So evidence of storm or no storm, they were in a position where they must mind the master because if they would have said circumstances depict that we don't obey God, do we go with the circumstances or do we go with what our Savior has told us to do, then they would have been in disobedience to the instructions of the Savior. So whether storms come up suddenly, whether there was evidence of a storm, it doesn't matter. Here are some believers that are minding God in the presence of God, in fellowship with God, serving God, and God, Jesus, tells them, sends them right in to a storm. I bring that up because sometimes storms come in our life as well. We're not physical storms with thunder and lightning, but difficulties and hardships that we often apply it that way. And, and a lot of times when storms come our way, we say, dear God, what's going on? What's happening? What did I do? Are you judging me? Are you chastening me? Is there something I should have done different? Am I out of your will? I mean, a lot of things come on, but here in our mind, but here we have a passage of scripture of children of God in fellowship with God, minding the Lord, serving the Lord, and the Lord sent them right into a storm. Verse number 39 of chapter four, and he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased. Look at this. There wasn't just a calm. And there was a great calm. Because whatever God does, he does a thorough job. Amen. And he said unto them, why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him, ignore the chapter division, and they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes, and when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. You say, wonderful, brother Hart, great. So what? So chapter 5, verse 6. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshiped him. Here's a man that lives in the mountains. Here's a man that has a high vantage point. Here's a man that could easily see across the sea, even the shore on the other side of the sea. Here's a man in the mountains, this maniac of Gadara that has a high vantage point, can see all the way across the sea, not hard to do. He saw this night something that he has seen many, many times before. He saw a ship on the shore on the other side of the sea. He saw people get in that ship. Once they got in that ship, they began to sail. And when they got into the midst of the sea, all of a sudden a storm came. He has seen that many, many times because he's been living here in the mountains, in the tombs, on the edge of this sea. He no doubt it's very possible because it's not very far across this sea. It's possible that even in the midst of the storm, he heard the cries of the disciple. It may be possible, just think with me for a moment, it may be possible that they even, uh, that he even heard the disciples go and say, Master, carest thou not that we perish? This man living in the mountains on the edge of the sea with the common idea of these storms coming up has seen this many, many times. Oh, but my dear friend, on this particular night, he saw something that he had never seen before. All of a sudden, he saw a man come forth on the front of that ship and he heard that man say peace be still and that storm that that maniac has seen rage many many times all of a sudden settled down at the feet of the savior like a puppy dog does down at the feet of his master and there's no doubt in my mind that the maniac of Gadara said as he saw Jesus afar off and do that he said within himself if that man can do that with the storm he can help me and by 
the time Jesus got to the edge of the shore, he had come down off of that high vantage point, seeing Jesus afar off. And by the time the Savior got there, the man was waiting on him and presented himself to Jesus. And Jesus did for this man what nobody else could do. Good news, good news. God can do for us what nobody else can do. But the moral of the story is this, child of God. The storm isn't always for you. The storm isn't always for you. Unbeknownst to these disciples, unbeknownst to these believers, Jesus knew that there was a man possessed with unclean spirits on the other side. He knew that as he sent his children right into a storm. And no doubt about it, there's times that our Savior sends you and I into a storm and God works in our life and we learn from the storm. There's no doubt about it. But on this particular night, the Savior knew there was someone on the other side that was watching. And as Jesus did a work in and for the disciples that night, Jesus knew as he worked in believers' lives, it was going to be a testimony of the power of God of what God could do for him and the storm was not for the disciples though the disciples learned many things that night about the power of God the deliverance of God answered prayer but my friend the storm that night was for a demon possessed man that was watching on the other shore and there's times that our savior sends you and I right into a storm we're fellowshipping with God we're serving God We're trying to walk with God. It's not a means of chastening or judgment. And no doubt you and I are going to learn some things about the hand of God as you and I go through the storms of life. But hey, 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 the storm's not always for us. But oftentimes the storm that our Savior sends us into is a witness and a testimony for others that are looking on. You say, well, Brother Hart, that's pretty neat. No, that's not pretty neat. I've got Bible for it. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 1, if you would, please. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. While you turn there, oftentimes we talk about the different names of God in the Word of God. And when we bring up the names of God, oftentimes we think of Jehovah, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi, and so forth. Well, there's other names for God. Look at 2 Corinthians 1. And look at verse number three, blessed be God. Even, here's a name for God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's another one, the Father of mercies. Here's another one, and the God of some comfort, And the God of most comfort? No. The word of God says our heavenly father is the God of all comfort. Look at verse 4. Who comforteth us in all our tribulation. Why? That we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. How are we going to do it? By the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Hang with it now. Verse 5. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. Watch verse 6. Whether we be afflicted, It is for your consolation and salvation. The word salvation means deliverance and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings, which we also suffer. Whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. Sometimes our Savior sends us into some things for and on the behalf of other people that are watching our lives. Philippians 1 27, only let your conversation, when the word of God talks about conversation, he's not just talking about the words that we speak. He's talking about our manner of living. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Just as this man, the maniac of Gadara, had looked hopeless and helpless, Jesus met his need. He, Jesus can meet our needs as well. But in the meantime, People are watching us go through our storm, and the storm is not always for us. So, child of God, as you face that physical storm and that physical difficulty, and you've been to the doctor, and you've been through procedures, and you've got prescriptions, and it just doesn't seem like that anything seems to help, it just might be that the physical storm that you're going through, the storm may not be for you, 
but it may be for somebody else that's watching your life on the sideline. And child of God, as you go through that financial storm, you're tithing, you're giving an offering, you're giving to missions, you're doing what you're supposed to. You, 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 you're, you just seems like you can never, you can never get ahead. Finally, you get caught up and you get everything paid. And maybe, maybe I'm, I, I need to quit talking about this. I say, I say you finally get caught up and you get your little $20 bill and stick it between the mattress and box springs and, and, and come out into the other room and say, sweetheart, we, we've got to start. Here we go. It's all, it's all going to be okay from here. We're, we're all on the level. Even got my little, even got my little nest egg in the other room between the mattress and back springs. I'm going to quit saying this. And then I usually say when I talk about right now, then I say, then the refrigerator goes out. I'm going to quit saying that because about six weeks ago, a refrigerator went out. I find out them things ain't cheap, not cheap at all. So I need to come up with another illustration. Well, wait a minute. Refrigerator's already gone out, so hopefully it'll stay good. I'll keep using that illustration because if I say the car will break down, then the car will break down. But anyway, then all of a sudden something happens and, and the batteries go out in the car or whatever the case may be. And it just seems like you can never, 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 never get ahead. Well, it just might be that that financial storm that you're going through, that storm may not be for you. But that storm might be somebody else that's watching your life. That family storm that you go through. You know, it's an amazing thing. We come to church, we shake hands one with another. And, uh, um, 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 hey, 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 brother, hey, sister, how you doing? Can I remind us that that's just a figure of speech we really don't want to know? Because some folks will tell you, hey, sis, how you doing? Oh, I'm brother hard. I want you to know my back. It's been out for three weeks, and I just really, I, I, I really didn't want to know. I, it was just a figure of speech. And so I've learned, you know, when I go to some churches, some, you know, sometimes you can say, hey, brother, how you doing? Other folks, you just say, good to see you. Amen. Now, look. I don't know what I said to you tonight, okay? I don't know what I said. So don't, don't take anything personal about that. Don't sit there and say, you know what? Brother Hart did say good to see you tonight. No, I didn't keep track. Now, I haven't had no problems at Twin Ports Baptist Church. But, 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 but let me tell you something that never happened. Never. Never happened. Never happened. You come to church, shake hands. Hey, brother. How you doing? You never. You never have some brother say, well, I'll preach and I'll tell you this. Me and the wife has been at each other's throat for the last three weeks. Now, that may be the case, but thank the Lord people don't talk about it. Amen. But you know what? Things may not be good at home. I, I sure hope not. Are you listening? It's one thing to have trouble down on the job. It's another thing to have trouble at home. Yeah. It's one thing to have trouble at church. I don't want trouble nowhere. But it's another thing to have trouble at home. And maybe things aren't too good at home. I, I hope that's not the case. I hope that's not the case. Maybe, maybe I'm preaching to some parents tonight. That your heart is sunk to your toes and you'll be the very first to admit, I, I wasn't the perfect parent. There's things that I could have done better. But you're, you've got children or maybe even grandchildren. They're not in this church. They're not in any church. They're away from the Lord and your heart is sunk to your toes because of your children and your grandchildren. You're so burdened for them. And you're going through a, finance, uh, you're going through a family storm. Hey, 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 hey. No doubt about it, we'll learn some things from the hand of our Savior going through our storms. But it could be that that family storm that you're going through isn't for you. It's for somebody else, an emotional storm. God made us human beings emotional creatures. Sometimes we have some emotional issues. They, they say you're not a very good Baptist preacher unless you mention Charles Spurgeon. So I'm going to be a good Baptist pre preacher, so let me mention Charles Spurgeon right now. They say that Charles Spurgeon uh, would have fits of depression. And he had another, I'm told he had another lodging place, some kind of a cabin or another house or something that he would go and get alone all by himself for long periods of time, just him and the Lord until he got that thing sorted out. I'm just simply saying, we don't talk about it, but children of God have some emotional problems. And it just could be, my dear friend, that the emotional storm that you're going through and you're dealing with, the storm, you're going to learn some things in the hand of your Savior. And God will work in your life. But while God works in your life, there may be somebody on the sideline, we don't know their name or their address, that is watching you go through your emotional storm. And the storm may not be for you. What about people problems? What about social storms? People problems. I mean, we've we got people problems. We've got people problems in the neighborhood. We, we, people problems down on the job. People problems. I, you know, I, I can't help it. I live in town. I can't help it that the gumballs off of my tree falls into my neighbor's yard because the branches of my tree is overhanging his fence. I can't help it. But sometimes people don't like that. And there's people problems in the neighborhood. 
And there's people problems down on the job. And, and social problems, maybe people problems with maybe people problems within a family. I don't know. I don't know. But I'm just simply saying maybe the social storm that you're going through, the storm may not be for you. My friend, Jesus sent his disciples into the storm. Jesus knew that he could trust his disciples with the storm. He knew that they wouldn't jump ship. He knew that they wouldn't be able to take it into their own hands. The Savior knew that he could trust the disciples with a storm. Hang with it now. I'm about done. Hang with it now. So let me ask you this. How are you handling your storm? I could take you tonight, and I won't, to the end of that that, 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 that passage of Scripture, that chapter you're very familiar with, the Sunday night crowd about David and Bathsheba. And the last line of that chapter said, and the thing that David did displeased the Lord. Then I could take you to Numbers chapter number 11 and verse number 1. When Israel is in the wilderness and the word of God says, and when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. Isn't it an amazing thing in the word of God and evidently in the mind of God, what David did with Bathsheba And the graping of God's people is equal. So, child of God, I ask the question again. How are you handling your storm? Are you whining and griping and complaining what's going on? I wish I didn't have to deal with this. This is a mess. This is is, is just ridiculous. When all the while, it may be that your Savior has sent you into that storm... Not just for you to learn something, but that storm might be for somebody else. How are you handling your storm? Let me tell you about Helen and Seawood Jones that I quit. Helen and Seawood Jones. Helen Jones was a faithful member at, when I passed her down in Jerseyville. Pastor Wagon Shoot, you've been down there before. Helen, when I became the pastor there in South Central Illinois, Helen Jones came to me and said, Pastor Hart, would it be all right with you if the nursery... Every week during Sunday school was my Sunday school class. I I want the nursery every Sunday morning during Sunday school. I said, let me pray about it. Yep, you can have it. (laughs) She said, Brother Hart, she said, while those little toddlers are playing with the toys and while those babies are in the cribs, she said, I'm going to teach them verses. I'm going to sing them songs just like the other Sunday school classes are going to sing. And she did that. Every Sunday morning. In fact, Andrew, when he was very young, before he had a seizure near his eighth birthday, Andrew could quote Psalm 23. He could quote every verse. If you started Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, he'd take off and he'd quote the entire chapter. You know where he learned that? I didn't teach it to him. Helen Jones taught it to him, Sunday school. We taught him other verses and he could quote them. He had a seizure near his eighth birthday and he's not able to do that now. But nonetheless, I'm just simply saying, Helen Jones was faithful. She was there at every service. Now, her husband, Seawood Jones, was a hit-and-miss church member, and he was more missed than he was hit. Numerous times, Sister Jones would raise her hand, and pray for Seawood. Pray for Seawood. Please pray for Seawood. He'd get right with God. He'd get in church. There was, there was numerous times that Helen Jones would come to me privately and say, Pastor Hart, Maybe we just need to pray that Seawood would get saved. He just has no mind for church. He's just got no mind for the word of God and the ways of God. Maybe we just need to pray that he'd get saved. Seawood Jones would come on special occasions and then just every once in a while he'd just pop in. You know how folks do that. That's the way way Seawood Jones, her husband, was. One day I got word that Seawood Jones went to the hospital. It was not anything life-threatening, but he was sick enough to go to the hospital. And so as the pastor, of course, I put my... Uh, my, my, my shirt and tie and sport coat on and I went to visit to pray with him in the hospital and sure enough I got there there's Seawood Jones in the hospital bed and we visited a little bit Helen Jones' faithful wife faithful church member uh, was there and we visited a little bit and pretty soon Helen Jones said oh Pastor Hart I want you to meet Mr. and Mrs. Ritchie you know how they have two people in a room and the curtain that divides them and she pulled the curtain back and there was another gentleman um, farther back in the room by the name of Mr. Ritchie. They lived about 20, 25 miles away in a neighboring town, elderly folks. And they said, I want you to meet Mr. and Mrs. Ritchie. And so I visited with them a little bit. And, and, and Helen Jones, Sister Jones said, I've invited them 
to our church. And right there on that little table that they have beside the bed in the hospital, I saw one of our church invitational tracks. Oh, Brother Hart, I've been telling them about our church and how wonderful our church is and how wonderful our music program is. How come they always talk about the music and not the preaching? <laughs> but I'm a big boy. I can take it. And so, and so I, I visited with them a little bit. And I honestly don't remember. I honestly don't remember if Mr. and Mrs. Ritchie let me pray with them. But I, I prayed with Seawood and Helen Jones and and I left. It probably, Brother Wagon Shoots, it probably was not two weeks. You, you was in that little sanctuary when you step in from the outside other than a very, very small foyer. I mean, you're in the sanctuary immediately. Little, little sanctuary, eight pews on each side, not a very big building. It probably wasn't two weeks that when we got done teaching Sunday school, I taught the adult class in the, in the sanctuary area. Mrs. Ritchie came in by herself. She came in and she sat on the back row. For the morning service. Well, you know, they say the churches take on the personality of the pastor. So we had a loud mouth church. Hallelujah. I mean, we were happy. We were saved. And our sins were forgiven. And we were rejoicing and raising our hands. Mascara was, was, was running down women's cheeks. Praise God, we're going to have a snot slinger. Amen. And we're just happy to be saved. Lord, we just had church. And no doubt Mrs. Ritchie sitting back there thinking, what in the world did I get into? I went ahead and preached the word of God. I don't, I don't know why I remember, but I remember what I preached that day. I remember I preached on the four faithful sayings of the Apostle Paul. Four times in the writings of the Apostle Paul, he says, this is a faithful saying. I, I only remember one of them. This is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of who I am chief. That's one of the four. There's three other ones. This is a, and I preached on the four faithful sayings of the Apostle Paul. The invitation time, Mrs. Ritchie got up, walked the aisle. Nailed at the altar. One of our ladies took her, opened up the word of God, took her into a side room, and introduced her to the Son of God, the Lord yes. Jesus Christ. Amen. I visited in Mr. and Mrs. Ritchie's home several times. Mr. Ritchie wanted nothing to do with the house of God or the God of the house. Mrs. Ritchie being up in years, you say, how old is that, Brother Hart? Well, it's older than me, and it's getting older all the time, okay? Mrs. Ritchie, being up in years, was concerned about driving herself to church. And so she was not able to come as much as she wanted to. But you're going to have a really, really hard time convincing this tall, loud mouth, hard headed Baptist preacher that the storm that Helen and Seawood Jones went through to put Seawood Jones in the hospital, the storm wasn't just for Seawood Jones. But God Almighty knew that C. Wood Jones would be in the same hospital room as a man by the name of Mr. Ritchie. And God in his foreknowledge knew that Helen Jones would be faithful enough to invite Mr. and Mrs. Ritchie to the house of God. And God in his foreknowledge knew that Mrs. Ritchie would accept that invitation and drive herself to a church that she has never been to before and hear the word of God preach and the spirit of God dealt with her and she got up of her own will and received the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm here to tell you the storm wasn't just for Seawood Jones. The storm was for an elderly lady by the name of Mrs. Ritchie because God knew she would get born again. Hey, hey, hey. The storm is not always for you. We're going to learn some things going through our storm about the hand of God, the power of God, answered prayer, and the deliverance of God. But my dear friend, we need to get to the place where we look beyond our own nose. It's not all about us. There's a lost and dying world that knows more about us than what we realize. And as we go through our storms of life and God works in our life and we stay faithful to him in the midst of the storm, it's going to be a testimony to others of what God can do in their life. So instead of whining, griping and complaining about the circumstances that very likely our God has sent us right into. Why don't we say, thank you, Lord. Thank you that you still know my address. Thank you that you've seen fit to send me into a storm to be a testimony for you in other people's lives. How are you handling your storm? Maybe, maybe, maybe you just 
be a good reminder tonight for us to find a place where we could get on our face before the throne of grace and say, Lord, forgive me for murmuring and whining and griping and complaining. And all the while, you're trying to use me in somebody else's life that's watching me go through my storm. You're in the midst of a storm. I'm here to tell you, Jesus is able in his way and in his time to do for you what nobody else can do. Let's stand, please, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Our ladies are going to come and play, I assume. I'm going to pray. Here's these altars. Here's these front chairs. What about you tonight? How are you handling your storm? It just may be that the storm isn't always for you. My Father, in Jesus' name, I bow before you. I pray that you'd strengthen us. I pray that you'd help us. I pray that you'd encourage us. But at the same time, my Lord, if we've not received that storm into our life, those circumstances into our life properly, we, like Israel, have murmured and griped and complained. May we do business with you about that, Lord. And then may we continue to seek your face, that you would work and you would move, yea, even deliver, if you choose, us from our storm, whatever we may be facing. Work in our life, but please, Lord God, just make us a tool in your hand that you would work in other people's lives for your honor and glory as well as we be a testimony of what you can do. Heads are bound, eyes are closed, ladies begin to play. Here's these altars.